For all that hope can gift us, when proven false, the effect is enough to demoralise armies or provide the spark which burns down empires. Primarchs command a state of being more than merely existing, unlike so many of their followers tend to, who are constrained to the rules of mortality and natural order of the universe. They do not obey any sane law of time, ageing at a markedly unhurried rate, their fate more so determined by their own acts of hubris or some legendary opponent than the unworthy foe that is the steady passing of years. A Primarch's presence strikes so much more than awe in those around them, enemy or ally alike. A sense of respect for a dominant predator, or even deep appreciation for their flawlessness, flows through those who are allowed to bask in their presence, threatening to overwhelm even transhuman senses, whilst a pervasive dread causes all but the most brave or insane to avert their gaze. Their every act is considered holy, possessed of a drive which is contagious as it is inspirational. Their will commands countless banners, whilst at their behest entire systems are put to the sword. Though for all these gifts and more, at the core of every Primarch, Loyalist and traitor alike, lies the seed of chaos. Even noble Sanguinius and dutiful Rebute have, in the deepest recesses of their soul, a spark of otherworldly sorcery whose origin is not so pure. From one end of the galaxy to the other, news slowly spreads of the godson's return. Imperium Sanctus has already felt the presence of the avenging sun, the fires of his determination whipping millions into a zealous fury, providing his crusade fleets with willing recruits. Within the most damned reaches of Nihilus, hard-bitten Imperial defenders, exhausted and frightened beyond reason, hold true to their cause. They defend their homes from the violent attentions of Xenos raiders or heretical pirates, having heard on etheric currents or by fleet-based runners that the ancient Primarch of the Dark Angels has vowed to take up arms and fight for Nihilus freedom. But what if the Lion and the Avenging Sun were the lucky ones? What if their brother Jagatai perished in the webway, assailed by countless hordes of Drakari or Neverborn? What if the Praetorian really did meet his end at the hands of a thousand mortal traitors? Whilst news of the return to Primarchs restores the will to fight for many millions of brave souls, what of the hope that more of the Emperor's sons will soon follow? This of course is unknown, something which surely troubles terrible renegade warlords as well as bemusing the Lord of the Thirteenth Legion. He is aware his brother Lionel Johnson is returned. Does he assume others have likewise been gifted the chance to rebuild a shattered Imperium? Time will tell. But for all the hope and even excitement towards the anticipation of yet another of the Emperor's missing sons returning to guide humanity towards a more logical and lightened future free of heresy and suffering, I fear a dark but necessary question must be asked, one which, if it were ever to be proven true, could spell the doom of many, including Gilliman or the Lion themselves. Could it be that one, or even more, of the missing Loyalist Primarchs have not returned because of a reason that is utterly sinister? What if Corvus Korak's transformative powers have also maliciously damaged the Ravenguard Primarch's soul? Millennia has passed within the material realm, whilst to Corvus himself, these may have felt like mere days, or even hundreds of millennia. For time is not a straight line, it is said. This is especially true in the Immaterium. Since his departure from his sons, he has been intent on tracking down and ending the life of his accursed brother, he who perhaps earned the title of Arch Traitor more than his brother Horus, Lorgar Aurelian. Though none can pierce the eye with ease, it could safely be assumed that whilst within his millennia-long meditation and afterwards, Lorgar would not be dwelling in any location which could be termed free of mutation or corrupting influence. Do you believe that the Primarch of the Ravenguard 
could travel through the rent in reality, that is the cicatrix maledictum, but elect to not contact his gene sons, due to the creature he has become. We may find out in the years to come, but what do you think? Suppose that Lehman Russ has become blood crazed and animalistic within the warp itself, devolving into more wolf than man. The blood god Corn would so treasure such a powerful combatant. Is the wolf king's purity of spirit and legendary obstinate attitude sufficient to ward off the warping influence of chaos itself? There are some who speculate that Lehman Russ travels to Nurgle's pestilent garden, perhaps one of the deadliest realms in the entire Immaterium, on a vital quest to locate the Tree of Life, or otherwise, the imprisoned Aldari deity, Isha. Even if he is able to maintain his sanity, will he and his followers survive the contaminating unreality that is the realm of Nurgle? Were one of the Emperor's ancient loyal sons to return to the Imperium corrupted, this could mean defeat for the Imperium of Man throughout entire systems, or worse, their corruption and in turn their fealty to the Dark Pantheon. We must remember that the Emperor did perhaps bargain, but ultimately steal, power to craft his sons from the very beings who would bring low his Golden Empire. At the core of each son is anarchy in its purest form. Even united, do you believe Rabute and the Lion will actually provide effective leadership for a stable Imperium? Soon after the outbreak of the heresy, so long ago, the Primarch of the First stood ready to scour Ultramar of all life should his brother have exhibited the most minute level of corruption. Of course we know this did not occur, However, bad blood was always, and likely will always, exist between the two. But if they cannot forge a lasting relationship, humanity's age of enlightenment will never return, as it would take a will of iron paired with an astounding intellect to excise the cancer which pervades all logic within its ancient institutions, the ecclesiarchy itself. Or perhaps they will need to settle for lessening the poisonous stranglehold the church bears over their people. There are many capable champions, both of the ruinous powers and various Xenos races, whose renown, or rather infamy, is known across the stars. But to be a champion, the epitome of what it is to be a warrior, in the horror that is the 41st millennium, may yet prove a Primarch's undoing. Duelists such as Lucius the Eternal would so savour the taking of a Primarch's life. Abaddon the Despoiler would remove the greatest threat standing between himself and the Emperor's Golden Throne. Though beings of pure darkness are not the only threats to the life of one so mighty, the newly encountered Norn Emissaries and Norn Assimilators of the Tyranid race have proven capable combatants, rumoured to even be hunting Rebute himself. Even the curious Necron being known as Trazin would no doubt sacrifice much to counter Primarch amongst his museum's collection. If he doesn't have one already. Isn't it remarkable that in a dark, unforgiving age such as this, where billions clash under the booming rasp of war trumpets, such a meagre band of brothers hold sway over the hearts and minds of so many. One fact is for certain though, to be marked for greatness amidst a galaxy spanning war is to challenge those who are capable to take your life. Were a warrior of renown to ever lay low the likes of the avenging sun or the lion, they would rise to preeminence in the esteem of their deity and their species both. Do you believe all of the emperor's loyal sons will return to a beleaguered imperium?